Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Golden. Now, for more than a century, people around the world have been marking the 8th of March as a special day for women. It's called International Women's Day and it grew out of the labor movement to become a recognized annual event by the United Nations. It was first celebrated in 1911 in Austria, Denmark, Germany and Switzerland. The centenary was celebrated in 2011, so this year the world is technically celebrating the 110th International Women's Day. But what is it for? And is it a celebration or a protest? And what events are taking place this year in Nigeria and beyond to mark the day? Well, in a moment, we'll speak to the president of the Medical Women's International Association, Dr. Eleanor Mwadinobi, who's been a champion of women's rights here in Nigeria and beyond. But first, here's a message from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, to mark International Women's Day. From high job losses to exploding burdens of unpaid care, from disrupted schooling to an escalating crisis of domestic violence and exploitation, women's lives have been upended and their rights eroded. Mothers, especially single mothers, have faced acute anxiety and adversity. The consequences will far outlast the pandemic. But women have also been on the front lines of pandemic response. They are the essential workers, keeping people alive and holding economies, communities and families together. They are among the leaders who have kept prevalence rates lower and countries on track for recovery. This year's International Women's Day highlights the transformative power of women's equal participation. We are seeing it ourselves at the United Nations, where I am proud that we have achieved gender parity in UN leadership posts for the first time in history. The evidence is clear. When women lead in government, we see bigger investments in social protection and greater inroads against poverty. When women are in parliament, countries adopt more stringent climate change policies. When women are at the peace table, agreements are more enduring. And with women now serving in equal numbers at the top leadership posts at the United Nations, we are seeing even more concerted action to secure peace, sustainable development and human rights. In a male-dominated world, with a male-dominated culture, gender equality is essentially a question of power. And males are an essential part of the solution. I call on countries, companies and institutions to adopt special measures and quotas to advance women's equal participation and achieve rapid change. As we recover from the pandemic, support and stimulus packages must target women and girls specifically including through investments in women-owned businesses and the care economy. Pandemic recovery is our chance to leave behind generations of exclusion and inequalities. Whether running a country, a business or a popular movement, women are making contributions that are delivering for all and driving progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. It's time to build an equal future. This is a job for everyone and for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. And that's the uh, UN Secretary General there, um, Antonio Guterres, with his message on this day. Well, for more about International Women's Day, I'm joined now in the studio by Dr. Eleanor Mwadinobi, who's president of the Medical Women's International Association, which represents women doctors, medical workers, and students from all six continents and eight regions of the world. Thank you very much indeed for coming in thank you for having me and congratulations uh, on this day um, international international women's day of course mm -hmm. the idea is for people to take the time to reflect on gender equality and what more needs to be done how mm -hmm. are you reflecting on it i'm reflecting it as i on it as i do every day yes it's great that there is one day set aside to reflect on women's roles, but every day should be a day to reflect on what women mm. and men bring to the table. And I'm especially reflecting on it this year because the theme, the 
um, campaign looks at you know how we can make choices and there's there's the there's the pose where you put your hand up yes you know and um, but but the broader theme looks at women's participation um, and how we can deliver on equality um, in a COVID-19 world and if we're going to be making choices we need to put our hands up as humanity not just as women not just as men but to say that we must bring an end to some of the in fact all of the obscene acts of criminality and cruelty to women that we see around us, some of them almost normalized. You know, we're talking of things like violence against women and girls, things like the kidnappings that we've seen recently, targeted femicide. Those are truly ex ex extremely obnoxious. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I agree with you 100% and I'd raise my hand in support and I don't mean this in a jocular manner, but of course the kidnapping is not limited to women, is it? I mean, no, no, a lot of male students have also mm -hmm. been uh, kidnapped. But, but what's being done here in Nigeria and mm -hmm. globally to mark this day? Well, to mark this day, people are speaking up. Like speaking. you're doing now. Oh, absolutely. And we have to give thanks to the media. In fact, just this afternoon, I, I was speaking to a young journalist and saying how important investigative journalism is mm. regarding you know, the types of violence that are below the radar. So it's about amplifying voices. It's about bringing to the fore some of you know, the, the, the practices that I've mentioned that are hidden mm. but also speaking up against those that are glaring but that's on the one side on the other side we must celebrate our women who have broken the glass ceiling we must celebrate the presidents female presidents and prime ministers who are now coming into positions who are in positions of leadership we're looking at you know women who are moving from the you know proverbial bedroom and other room to the boardroom we're looking at w women as heads of corporations who are role models for young girls so it's a time to celebrate mm women who have achieved as well as a time to reflect as well as a time to reflect Charles and, and where um, Dr. Wadinobi on the African continent mm -hmm. would you say that women are most empowered and I understand that mm -hmm. I was looking at scores recently that mm -hmm. Mauritius scores mm -hmm. top marks in the global ranking that assesses gender laws and reforms and the various efforts to eliminate discrimination and support women. They, mm -hmm. they did a survey in the past yeah. year. Well, we do have quite a few examples. Rwanda mm. is one. Um, well, Rwanda is very so particular, though, in terms <laughs> of the parliament, the empowerment, yes. you know, the, because they've made a specific number of women. That's correct. Yeah, Over a law 60%. that includes a specific number Yes, of women. but when you look at the parliament, the mm. parliament is important because mm. that's where no, law, laws are made. And you know, we need to work within a framework. And therefore, when you look at countries that have a good representation of women in parliament, they're able to bring those perspectives mm. to the table so that you're not struggling with the age old you know barriers and hindrances that women have had to go through whilst working alongside men that makes it that much more difficult um, so you know 
on the continent, we do have examples to look to. Some people do argue, for example, that you know, uh, quite a few of the countries have come about as a result of conflict. Yes, indeed, every crisis is an opportunity to rebuild. We have a war of sorts mm. in our midst at the moment, the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the glaring things about it is how women have responded. In fact, uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres, you know, um, alluded to that. So you've got women in the front lines. You've got women who have responded with their creativity, with their ingenuity, with their resilience. Mm. And I believe strongly that as we build back better, as all have said we need to, because this is sort of like a good timeline for us, rising out of the COVID-19 crisis, we are provided with an opportunity where we need to look critically mm. and in detail at how women have managed in their homes, you know, um, in their workplaces, being on the front lines, and bringing that into the post-COVID era, there is a lot to borrow from. No, absolutely. And, and just looking at yeah. that um, score sheet mm -hmm. again, Mauritius scored 91.9 yes. out of a possible 100 points, making it the highest ranking African country on the index. But it's mm -hmm. interesting that the second highest scoring African country mm -hmm. was actually South Africa. Um, and I think Rwanda mm -hmm. came fourth or something. Right. Um, but apparently Nigeria mm. scored pretty low on that index. What's your yeah. assessment of that? I, well, I'm not surprised. Um, having worked in the area of you know, women's equality, women's empowerment, violence against women, looking at you know, barriers mm. to leadership, looking at harmful traditional practices, we still have a long way to go around patriarchy, around education for our girls. You and know, I remember you did yeah. a lot of work on, on widows and Absolutely. things Absolutely. Well. So, you know, those obnoxious practices for women who had lost their husbands at a time when, you know, they needed all the, you know, care. Um, but isn't that changing, it, though? I mean, there are laws that are coming into force, aren't there? There are laws coming into force, and that's a good place to start. However, the law in and of itself is not the end game. It's the implementation Absolutely. of the laws. It's the monitoring. It's, it's us being able to test the laws in our courts. And we haven't gotten there yet. So. I'll give an example. We have the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act in Nigeria, 2015, but only applicable to the Federal Capital Territory. And now we have to ensure that the 36 states, you know, have domesticated mm. that. But that's only a beginning. Having said that, I do wear another hat belonging to a coalition called the Every Woman Treaty. And we are advocating for a global treaty to end every form of violence on earth in order that women and girls can achieve their potential and the highest of human flourishing. Okay. That's very interesting. Please yeah. stay with us. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching the Arise interview. Thank you more still ahead as we continue our chat about International Women's Day. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Onyegolu. So today, March the 8th, marks International Women's Day. It's a national holiday in many countries, including Russia, China, and some parts of Europe. In the US, the month of March is Women's History Month. 
and a presidential proclamation issued every year honors the achievements of American women. This year, though, International Women's Day looks a little different because of coronavirus, and more virtual events are expected to take place around the world. But the issues remain the same. How do we get more women into leadership positions across the world? How do we improve gender equality? And of course, the theme for this year is women in leadership, achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world. And the campaign theme is hashtag choose to change. And Dr. Eleanor Mwadinobi, president of the Medical Women's International Association, which represents women doctors, medical workers, and students from all six continents and eight regions of the world is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. And before we went on a break, we're yeah. talking about Nigeria generally. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that most people in Nigeria want women to be able to achieve what they deserve and to have the same level of success as men in this country? Mm. I think there's a problem there with the mindset and, you know, it's because of years of deep-seated patriarchy, deep-seated, you know, stereotypical roles that have been ascribed to women over the years. Mm. Having said that, um, when you realize that, you know, when you look back in history, we had, you know, women in community leadership, women who, you know, led armies. We had women who led protests, like the Abba women's protests, you know, for unfair taxes. Um, and unfortunately, we have not had enough women in leadership um, you go through literally every sphere of endeavor. So it needs to start, first of all, with that mindset that women can achieve. And the more of them that we have, the more there will be role models, mm. as I've said before. You know, the likes of, you know, our recently celebrated Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, heading the World Trade Organization, for example, is a good example that girls can dream. Mm, but we could also fall into the trap of holding her up, like, you know, a bit like the yeah. black token in Western countries. Like, well, hey, look yeah. what we've got here. We but had Barack Obama, sort of thing. Yeah, but that's a start. Yeah. That's a start. So it's about getting women, uh, uh, girls in school, getting them to actually, for there to be retention, mm. for them to complete their education, for them to, you know, not be barred from, you know, some of these, you know, stereotypical uh, um, roles, you know. So engineering, aeronautics engineering, that sort of thing, letting women and girls participate equally, giving them those equal opportunities. But doesn't that go back yeah. to the family, though? Because, I mean, I've Absolutely. spoken to a lot of very, very important women, you know, people, yes. women like yourself, quite uh -huh. a few others, I mean, women yeah. who've reached the highest levels at the United Nations, and they yeah. always said, oh, my father yeah. pushed me and, mm -hmm. you know, didn't get in my way in terms of education and that sort of thing. I couldn't agree more. It absolutely starts with the family. It starts with responsible parenting. Mm. It starts with parents, mother, father, both, believing in their children, boy or girl, providing for them, you know, the best opportunity within whatever resources that they have and, you know, not one in preference of the other. And, you know, how chores, simple things as chores, mm. how chores are divvied up in the home, where, you know, the boy is encouraged to go and study, and the girl is, you know, forced 
to do the domestic work. But that's and changed then, a lot, though, hasn't it? it it's I mean, I I would certainly say in it's urban changing. areas. It's changing. Right. And, you know, you say in urban areas, you know, you go to the rural areas and, you know, you find out that, you know, there are some parts, not just in Nigeria, around the world, where it's still difficult to get girls into school. Mm, I agree. Because they're being made at a very young age right. to either hawk on the streets or married off, mm. you know, uh, to, to, you know, uh, uh, an older man. So it starts from the home. But then there's the continuum of, you know, the education environment, whatever type of education it might be, so that there's that opportunity for the growth of knowledge, for education, mm. and then, you know, for, for there to you know, the, the choices to be available to yes. whatever that The glass girl. ceiling not to be there at all. Not the glass ceiling shouldn't be there at all. Yeah. And I can give an example of what we call the scissor graph in medicine. Yes, we've got more girls going into med school, but sadly, when you go to the, you know, hierarchy, to the higher echelons of you know, the leadership, mm. be it, let's say, in a university or in a teaching hospital, you know, when you look for women in the leadership, there are few women there. So, and they have to, you know, work harder. We're, we're saying, yes, they must show the competence, the skills, the character required, mm. but, you know, don't put that extra fence in the way and you know when it comes to affirmative action there should be that level playing that's field. where the government comes in basically that's the where the legislature the and all legislature that. the government right to support but, what's happening in the family yes indeed but for all that we want government to do we as the citizens also have to play our part. No, absolutely. We need to create the demand. We need to be able to monitor, monitor what's happening in our environment. We need to advocate. We need to choose to change. We need to question the status quo. We need to be able to condemn when things are not going right. Those are very important points. Of course, none of us would be here if it yeah. wasn't for a woman or, or a true. man for that matter yeah um nevertheless um it, it's imp the, the question must be asked and i think you're asking it mm. very well um if we owe our presence to both genders why yeah. is it that women are often at a disadvantage when it comes to things like leadership and other important business it's that disadvantage that's mm. the issue. That's the issue. And I, you know, I want to, you know, use this opportunity also to state that, yes, women do produce 100% of the world's population, but you see, we also should not um, restrict um, the, the importance of women in any society absolutely. to their wombs. Yes, yes. Or to their. That is know, absolutely true. Yes. That's an essential function. point to make. Yes. Um, so, f for young African girls, mm. let, let me limit it to that, watching yeah. this interview right now, what's your message to them yeah. on this International Women's Day? Is, that, mm. is it that they can, they can be all that they dream to be, or mm. would you say that there are reproaches still holding them back from it? And we've got just yeah. 30 seconds, I'm afraid. They can. I encourage them to dream. I also encourage them to take a step every day towards actualizing that dream. Right. I encourage them to aggregate and congregate in bringing their voices together okay. in order to speak up in a manner that spaces will be created for Dr. them. Dr. Eleanor Wadinobi, President of the Medical Women's International Association, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Baghdad and London. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.